Welcome to the December 2022 Architectural Series, guest speaker of NORED. I'm Silvio Baldessera, chair of NOR, founder of NORED, and your host today. NORED is a continuing education program founded 15 years ago with three main goals, which are to teach, learn, improve, and to do that continuously. The program relies on bringing the best speakers in three specific areas, architecture and engineering, which are of equal importance, and the masters, where we learn from the past. Each of the NORAD series starting in 2020 have been recorded with the guest speaker's permission and are available on NORAD YouTube for global access. Today's session will be posted in one week. Welcome to all of our NOR 14 office staff and invited guests globally. Welcome also to the invited students from the 14 schools of architecture in Canada, the US and the UK. In preparation for today's NORED on women in architecture, it is worth looking at the past and I go back to 1894, when Marion Mahoney graduated from MIT and became the first licensed woman architect in Illinois. Mahoney worked in the Chicago office of Frank Lloyd Wright and designed furniture, lighting, stained glass, and decorative fittings. But it was her Japanese inspired presentation drawings that were most valued. In 1909, Mahoney took over many of Wright's projects and completed them. But after her marriage with former Wright employee Griffin, the two won Australia's new capital, Canberra, and they moved to establish a career together in Australia. In 1938, her husband passed away and she returned to practice in Chicago until she passed away in 1961. The unfortunate reality is that Mahoney was never credited for the work under Wright and lived with her partner husband Griffin's shadow for most of her life until finally being architecturally recognized on her own after his death. Marion Mahoney Griffin was a woman ahead of her time and the driving force of her firm. Over five decades, she promoted progressive ideas that are as relevant today, 150 years after she was born as they were in her own time. Imagine what she could have accomplished if she was born today. Today, our guest speaker, another woman in a more recent time who will share her history together with two other women that have built architectural practices and more respectfully recognized women in architectural practice today. Our guest speaker today is Gina Van Tyne. Gina is the founding partner of Inform Studio in Detroit, Michigan, an innovative and collaborative design practice founded in 2000. Inform Studio's emphasis on civic, community, and placemaking design has resulted in award-winning projects with more than 50 AIA Design Awards. Gina has led Inform's national prototype programs for major clients in retail, healthcare, and other industries. Gina graduated <clears throat> from Lawrence Tech University with a BA and a BS in architecture, and in 2014 was distinguished with the Architecture Alumni Award. In 2021, Gina was the recipient of the AIA Detroit Gold Medal. Gina is an advocate for helping young women seeing value in their careers in architecture and lectures at Lawrence Tech University, hosting events for middle school girls at the American Association of University Women and mentoring middle schools at HPBC in Southfield. Welcome Gina Van Tyne, who is going to share her presentation starting from ground zero. Gina Van Tyne. Thank you, Silvio. Thank you, Norred. 
um, for inviting me and for creating this series. Um, it's a it's been a fascinating series to watch uh, develop over over this year. Uh, that's kind of when I uh, realized what was going on. Um, and as Silvio mentioned, this is kind of about my journey um, in starting an architecture firm over 20 years ago, and how has it evolved. Um, I'm excited that there are students across the globe, as well as many members of NOR tuning in, and I hope I can share some stories and insights uh, with all of you. In our firm, we aspire to make places that inspire and impact. Uh, the most important thing that we do, uh, besides it practicing and impacting the practicing in and impacting the communities we design in is helping our people in the office develop. We want to impact the people inside our office and the people outside. We have several people that have been awarded AIA's Young Architect of the Year and graduated people who have started their own firms. That is so important to us and we helped that we helped prepare them to step out on their own and they are being recognized for their successes and their achievements. I think as with anything, uh, growth and maturity change your perspective. Hopefully with age comes wisdom. Uh, the truth about us is that even though uh, we started our practice years ago, uh, we didn't have an org chart or a business plan. Um, we just wanted to practice. And, the, and so far we've, as we've grown, we've realized and come to realize the importance of those things and the imperativeness of those things. And about six years ago or so, we set out to uh, develop those. Little history here on our firm, you can see the different um, achievements that people in our office have, have uh, been able to garner. Um, we have four, four different young, uh, young architects that have won the award locally and in Michigan. And then we also have um, and the AIA Detroit Associates Award that was given out this year to Azubike. And I'll talk a little bit more about him later. Um, my husband and I started a firm with another par partner in 1990. And we, in 1993, we hired our first employee, Michael Guthrie. That's when we all met and we were doing small projects and eventually grew to a group of about 12. For almost 10 years, we came to realize as partners, um, we didn't want the same things. So that was really important because life is really too short to not do what you were hoping to do. So in 2000, Ken and Mike and I got together and decided to form a new partnership as Vantine Guthrie Studio of Architecture. The three of us all have different skills and talents. Mike is a visionary and very talented designer. Ken is a technical whiz and really can build anything or figure out how to build anything. For me, I've always been a people person. I can manage people and projects from a lot of different types to a lot at once. We didn't want to be a niche firm or a big corporate firm, we've always centered, wanted to be centered around making an impact. So in 2007, we changed our name to Inform Studio. We wanted a name that was more about what we did versus who we were, and wanted to emphasize that our office is a collaborative. It's how we've always been. We knew we all have different strengths and we were better together. In 2006, we had looked at potentially merging with another firm and that sort of prompted the idea of not adding names to our to our company name but actually changing our name altogether and talking more about what we did and what we wanted to do so currently i have two partners my husband ken van tyne michael guthrie uh, all three of us are founding partners and then currently we have another uh, principal in the office, uh, Corey Levine, and I'll talk more about how that all came about as, as we go along. <clears throat> Excuse me. We started out as an architecture, interiors, and urban design firm in 2000. And in 2017, we added on plumbing, mechanical, electrical engineering, and then started our 
foray and investigation into computational design, which we really call digital technology these days. So in 2001, we gained another key member of Inform Studio, and that's Corey that I mentioned earlier, who's been vital to our growth and design development and is now our chief design officer. Through our tenure so far, um, we've had several pivotal projects, as I call them, that in one way or another have shaped the trajectory of our practice. In 1998, uh, so right before we started our firm, we entered a international design competition, the Bagley Pedestrian Bridge, which is in Southwest Detroit. And <clears throat> it was a competition that was set up by the Michigan Department of Transportation and the city of Detroit. It was an open competition uh, and we won that competition. So first one ever and we won right away. We thought that was great. Um, the Bagley Bridge was an endeavor by the state of Michigan to heal this vibrant immigrant community after the freeway system that was built in the 1960s. It completely separated the heart of the community. 12 lanes of, of, of you know, freeway traffic uh, completely bifurcated the, the downtown of, of Mexican town as it's locally known. So, we were very excited about this opportunity and thought it would really help us start to make an impact uh, with our new partnership. But little did we know that 9-11 would throw a major wrench into that idea. So after a long hiatus, about four or five years, we, uh, we finally got the project started again. And you can see here the, uh, the lanes of traffic and how that just completely cut off one side of Mexican town to the other. In 2010, we finally were able to enjoy the actual opening of the bridge. And yes, it was 20 years later. We thought originally when the engineers told us that it could be a, or their last project was a 20 year project, we laughed and we said, oh, I'm sure that won't happen here, but it sure did. And um, recently, when we got together for the holidays, my brother told me about a woman that he had met that lived in Mexican town. And she related to him that it was, this bridge has become transformational in their community, which is exactly what you wanna hear, right? But she got really emotional about it. She said her, she's lived in the area her whole life and for years, you know, people did not traverse from one side to the other. So they were completely cut off from each other. So that, that's exactly what we set out to do. We wanted to make sure that we were making an impact on this community. The Bagley Bridge provides a street level experience and maintains a delicate balance between integrating into the existing neighborhoods and transforming the surrounding public space by providing an accessible pedestrian crossing including at grade, at grade landings and routes that do not require using stairs. The urban parks on either end um, return public space back to the citizens of the community. And the bridge also provides uh, spaces to admire and reflect on several regional and local and community landmarks. You can see here the uh, central train station that has been a very um, popular project in, in the, in the state of Michigan and in the city of Detroit, both for good and for bad. Um, then actually um, another pivotal project for us was Effigy Studio. This studio started in, uh, in 2004. We were looking at uh, a project for a recording engineer that had moved back home from New York and he had actually contacted the local AIA chapter about finding an architect. Uh, he told them he was looking for a firm that was innovative. And so we started talking to him and this project is actually located in a, a suburb just north of the city of Detroit on the other side of Eight Mile. Uh, it's an industrial building in Ferndale, Michigan. It's a live recording studio. And it's a prime example of collaboration between architectural design and technical experts in the field of acoustics and mechanical engineering, 
It's a, it's a result of an investigation on how spatial design can positively impact sound through thoughtfully organized space and carefully selected materials. A few years ago, our original client actually sold this studio to Eminem. And since its completion, um, it's, it's been on several or, you know, very uh, popular and very well-known artists uh, list to record there. So you, you can notice on some of their, their covers of their, their music that they've recorded at Effigy Studio in Detroit. Then another pivotal project for us, which both Effigy and the Grand Egyptian Museum kind of coincided uh, around the same time and actually helped us land uh, another project locally that was very important for our practice. The next pivotal project we worked on was again, an international competition, uh, but this time on the other side of the Atlantic, the Grand Egyptian Museum, also known as the GEM. Uh, I'm, I'm sad to say that we didn't win this project, but we, we really put a lot of heart and soul into this project. And we, um, we came up with an idea that we were the author of the idea. It was in the brief that the museum wanted to investigate hyperlink and how that could actually physically inform a design. So we came up with an idea about how to do that visually. Um, with every part of the museum interwoven, anyone could tour this entire collection without a guide. The entire museum was built on ramps. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and therefore you could see all the way through the museum um, and you could, you could actually make your own tour without, without needing any help from anyone really. So out of 1500 plus entries, we were shortlisted in the top 20 and then advanced to the final 10 to, be in, to then be invited to present our project in Cairo. It was super exciting even though we didn't, we didn't win this, this competition. So shortly after Effigy and the Gem, we tried to land another project. This one is local. Uh, in 2005, um, along with those two projects, we were able to land the new branch library for the Ann Arbor District Library System. Ann Arbor is directly west of Detroit and home to the University of Michigan. So it's, it's not a small city. But the Ann Arbor Library Board wanted to tour some of our projects before making a final decision. And while we were at Effigy, um, actually touring Effigy, our client was there, we were presenting the idea of the Grand Egyptian Museum to the board. And um, they also wanted to talk to Tom, the, uh, the owner, and ask him what it was like to work with us specifically, and then also someone who had never designed a recording studio before. And his response helped us win that project. The AIA, the AA library at the time, library director at the time, was exactly the type of client a young firm like ours really needed. She knew that she was the library expert and she wanted a design firm that wasn't afraid to port, put forth new ideas and actually innovate and help the library system move into a new era. That was really exciting for our firm. Someone that believed we had the ability to design without an abundance of experience in their typology was almost unheard of. The library director was very intrigued by our design thinking and how we approached the design for the gym. And she wanted to see what we could do with a branch library. She said, if you can think like that, then we wanna see what you can design for us. I'm sorry, I'm behind on my slides here. So this is still the gem. That was the model that we built that's actually in the Cairo Museum now. And then the Ann Arbor Library is on the north end of campus. And the project was also the first time we were able to ever immerse ourselves into a full research phase. The data that we were able to gather not only informed the design of the project, but also the operation of the entire library system. <clears throat> the project was built on a completely greenfield site. 
never had been built on before. And the problem that the site had, which we weren't aware of at the exact time that we started, was that the site was riddled with ash trees, which unfortunately had been devastated by the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer is a small insect that probably made its way over on ships um, and, and actually in, made its way into the ash trees here. The emerald ash borer will lay its eggs in the crevices in between the bark and then the larvae start to bore their way into the top layer between the wood and the actual bark, which actually kills the tree because there's no way for the tree to move nutrients and water up and down the tree. So because of this, there were several trees that needed to come out of, of the, um, the site. And we were able to, and yeah, yes, we actually did use draft horses and, and hand axes to get them out. We use them actually structurally, and we use them as finishes on the on the floor or on the furniture and on the walls as well. We've had several instances of people reaching out to us about using the ash wood, and unfortunately, it was too late for them. They they actually cut down their emerald ash trees and. Um, and had to wood chip them and, and dump them, um, which, is, which is really unfortunate, but nobody really knew for quite a long time that the wood was still viable. I have to say though, one thing I've learned over the years um, is that long-term relationships are, in business are really no different than those in your personal life. There's so many benefits to having long-term clients. The consistency of work, the opportunity to develop a real trusting partnership and the opportunity to grow and change with them and together. Verizon has been such a client for us. We didn't realize it, but we actually started on the ground floor with Verizon Wireless. They started in 2001 uh, building stores and actually becoming a wireless company. In our office, we have projects that use innovation in a very different way through what we call prototype projects. And Verizon has helped us uh, really move in that direction. They were looking for a firm who could create prototype retail for them for hundreds of stores across the country. And we've been that firm. <clears throat> we have completed over 500 projects for Verizon over the years. And this is where we've strongly incorporated our skills in computational design. We've worked with retail design and construction team for over 20 years now, and I've watched and been a part of their evolution from a telecommunications company to, a tech, to an actual tech company. We've had the good fortune to learn and grow with them, so it's pushed us further, faster than we probably would have by ourselves. Through scripting and developing ways to automate tools and different pieces of the, of the project, we've actually, our developer, our, our director of digital technology, Azubike Anonye, has spearheaded the development of the digital technology for Verizon and brings our projects to them in about a third of the time that it normally would. This speed to market is critical for Verizon and any really retail, really, retailer, really. And it's a major contributor to our high levels of customer service. Here you can see a dashboard that we designed to take a look at different patterns in brick for one of our projects here in Detroit, the Powabic Pottery. We're, we've developed other dashboards that help us track the different planned hours and job to date hours. It's not just about Revit or, or about looking at projects from you know, a digital perspective, but we can actually, we've actually been able to figure out how to use the software that we've been given and make it work better for us and actually able to graphically look at where we're at on projects. Zuby has also taken a look at software that helps us do layouts, um, so, you know, exterior layouts for fenestration, uh, patterns in brick or in panels, um, all different types of things. And in real time, our, our clients can see how this affects their pro forma. 
So there's been a whole lot of different pieces to um, digital technology that really has impacted our practice and is further impacting construction as a whole. In our office, we have a big idea of changing the process, the design and delivery process of the built environment. That's our grand vision. Digital fabrication along with computational design can change the way the built environment is designed and delivered. Digital processes have the potential to save time and money, but also deliver high quality design. The Van Leesten Memorial Bridge in Providence, Rhode Island is a good example of that for us. <clears throat> in another design competition in 2010, the city of Providence had funds to rework abandoned freeway infrastructure and connect five prominent neighborhoods and institutions within the city. The city would receive funding from Rhode Island's Department of Transportation if we were able to repurpose the, the uh, piers that you see here on the, on the water. So we were able to take a look at how can we use those, how can we use that to create a place and really use the bridge as more than just a vehicle from one side to the other. <clears throat> Acting as a pedestrian center, the bridge not only performs as a practical connector between the regions, but also offers multiple programmatic interventions to encourage community connection and social engagement among city residents. To get further into the computational and digital fabrication piece of this, the bridge is segmented into to five foot sections. Those sections were actually built off site, tagged and brought on site. And then they were, they were just a part of the installation. You can see that here. Because of that, we actually were able to trim six months off of the construction timeframe. In addition to establishing a visual symbol of renewal, the Van Leesten Memorial Bridge also provides access to over 40 acres of prime waterfront real estate that was freed up when the interstate I-195 was relocated. So while the history of the area will remain <clears throat> embedded in the bridge's foundations, this new gateway connects the site to the rest of the city. It gives it a new lease on life for future generations and has become a real destination point instead of just a way to traverse from one side to the other. The bridge allowed us to incorporate all of the digital technology that we had been investigating and using in pieces uh, on other projects. Sharing our model as a deliverable took some convincing to ride out for sure. And by segmenting the bridge into the five foot increments, that was key to helping us make sure that the quality was there as also being able to affect the construction schedule. It's our goal to incorporate digital technology into every project we have. We've been able to impact many of our projects with digital technology. One recently opened, also in Providence, the Roger Williams Park Gateway Center. And the fins that you see there were a part of our digital fabrication and digital technology. <clears throat> this project is, is not very far from the bridge actually, and has become um, a point of real pride for the city, uh, being able to reactivate this park. Another project that we used digital technology on uh, in a very, I would say rudimentary form, because I think a lot of people are using point clouds and scanning is the Cauley Ferrari dealership that we did a few years ago in um, West Bloomfield, which is not far from our office here. Ferraris obviously are known for their, their beauty, right? And, and the attention to detail. And when this project was actually framed, uh, we, were, we were told by the metal panel fabricator that we had a problem, of course. You know, not everything was perfect. I know that's surprising. 
Um, but we were able to do a scan of the building, take the scan and integrate it with our model and be able to tell the contractor and the fabricator exactly what needed to be done to the framing to make sure that the framing, when the panels came out, that they could actually just be installed without having to do any field adjusting really. And you can see the, uh, the seams on, on this project are, are done with much the same precision as a, as a Ferrari car itself, which we're, we're really proud of and everybody is really excited at the uh, Ferrari dealership about. Another project that we've been able to actually um, use automation in our preliminary design process and then design assist with the panel contractor was the M1 Concourse Center. This is in Pontiac, Michigan, which is about 15 miles north of our office. And this, is, this has become a community of gearheads and, and car lovers and enthusiasts. Um, and then they wanted to build an event center. So this event center, they wanted to portray the idea of speed uh, because it's, it's originally it was called the trackside building. So you can see that we, we looked at different ways to um, take and, and activate the elevation. And we worked closely with the, uh, with the contractor to know how much we could affect the panel coming off of the substrate and then actually stay within budget. So this was, this was critical to, uh, to making sure the project didn't get out of hand. But you can see that's, that's the track right there and the uh, buildings over to the right are actually the car condos uh, that everybody buys and works on their cars, houses their cars, you know, that type of thing. So looking forward in our business, uh, we have several projects that we're working on now that we're very in tune with digitally, uh, digital technology wise and, and looking to make further impact into other communities. One is in Miami, which is the Baywalk Bridge. Um, currently, it's, uh, it reimagines the public space in front of the museum park and under the I-395 highway, uh, connecting the museum park with neighborhood, neighboring green spaces and activating the waterfront for residents and visitors alike. This project has the potential to, to really impact this area and create a space where you can actually go out onto the water um, and, and enjoy those spaces out there. One of the other projects that we're working on is in Midtown Detroit. Um, we call it the MID. It's a mixed use development project and it's poised to be a new center for Midtown Detroit activity. Incorporating our programming software to investigate several layouts that enabled the developer to evaluate the performa in real time, we were able to, to actually help them understand uh, what the impact of the size of the units had on, on their financial numbers in, in the project. This 3.8 acre mixed, mixed use development is carefully planned to offer diverse programs, including retail, hotel, housing, dining experiences, uh, interwoven with public spaces to, for community residents and visitor engagement and connectivity. This project is currently in construction documentation phase and we hope to, uh, to break ground early next year. The last project that I'm gonna share with you is, uh, it was originally called the Lennox Community Center, but it's the AB Ford Park, which is in the Jefferson, um, East Jefferson East community on the east side of Detroit, uh, just right there um, in, in close proximity to Belle Isle. This is the first CLT project in the city of Detroit. So we're pretty proud of that. And um, it'll be opening in the spring uh, to bring a new community center to Jefferson East, which is this project had a very um, interesting, community engagement piece to it uh, because it was during COVID. 
So that was that was very interesting uh, for us. We we had to figure out creative ways to help people feel engaged and get engaged. So that pretty much sums up what I had to show for now. And we're going to get into some, some questions and, and answers time basically as a panel after this, but this gives you a brief overview of some of the major projects and pivotal points in our practices development. The projects help define a timeline, but for us, <clears throat> excuse me, it's also about the people. As we're continuing to grow, we're always careful not to grow too fast. We want to make sure that we're training and nurturing our staff and that they will be a part of our office family for a long time. It's very exciting to work on projects like this and continue to inspire and impact the future of our people and those in our cities and communities. So thank you. I appreciate your time. At this time, I want to introduce two people that I'm very proud to know. I've known them both for a very long time. Two women design leaders in the Detroit area who will share their own journeys. I've known both of them for a very long time. I, I, I don't even remember when I met Sandra. It was so many years ago. Um, but we, we met at an AIA seminar in, in Ann Arbor. And um, she has been through many different phases of her career, I think, already. Um, but she, uh, she and I have known each other and work together from AIA events to Lawrence Technological University events, our alma mater. And Courtney and I met each other when we used to work down the hall from each other. She was at the planning firm that's still down the hall from us. And then she started her own firm. We've partnered together on projects and relied on each other for expertise and advice over the years. And I'm very proud to, to introduce them. Sandra Little, FAIA Lead AP NOMA, is a Principal and Director of Diversity and Inclusion with Quinn Evans. She's an award-winning architect and advocate for the revitalization of the urban realm with a focus on creating equitable communities. She's played a leading role in promoting design as a critical component in the rebirth of Detroit and served as the only architectural representative on the Design Corps Advisory Board that was instrumental in nominating and naming Detroit as a UNESCO City of Design. Sandra has planned and designed many notable projects in Detroit and throughout the Midwest. She led a collaborative team to document and honor sites associated with the Black Civil Rights Movement in Detroit, a part of the National Park Service's efforts to provide a more inclusive in interpretation of American history. She's also served as architect and community engagement specialist for an inclusive master plan for the Warrendale Cody Road Rouge neighborhood, also in Detroit. Sandra has also focused much of her career on mentorship and introducing young minorities to the architecture profession. Over the past seven years, she's helped more than 200 black students at the middle school, high school and college levels explore the architectural field through paid internships, mentoring programs, career fairs and community forums, as well as the establishment of the Noma Detroit Project Pipeline Student Camp programs. Courtney Piotrowski, PLA, ASLA, Lead GA, is a founding principal and landscape architect at the Living Lab, a Detroit headquartered studio based on open space design, pedestrian bike mobility, and urban design. A thread through all of Living, Living Lab's work is their commitment to sustainable practices and green infrastructure. Courtney is recognized among her peers and clients for her unique ability to balance the art of design the technical aspects of construction and the emotion of planning public spaces and places. Her projects are context sensitive and create the best possible outcomes for the communities she works in. Much of her recent work focused on improving public spaces beloved by Detroiters. Each project has a foundation in deep conversations with the community, either through intensive framework planning or via participatory planning. Some of the, these projects include the award-winning Beacon Park in downtown Detroit, the development of Detroit's first shared street, Bagley, the improvement of West Grand Boulevard as it traversed into Riverside Park, and the development of a 98-acre golf course in Detroit into a nature park. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sandra and let her start with her story. Thank you, Gina, for inviting us today, and thank you for that great introduction. Let's share my screen. 
Um, so I'm going to just start out today um, by uh, talking about something that actually uh, Gina kind of started out with, right? Your relationships and being in the community. Um, I'll give a little bit of an overview of myself. Uh, as she said, I, as she introduced me, I have a lot of hats that I wear. I am um, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Point Avon. I'm the Midwest Vice, Vice, Regional Vice President for National Organization of Minority Architects. I'm the co-founder of a, a, um, a new venture that I've started called Noir Design Party that documents the work of African-American architects in Michigan. And my career is kind of flowing with all of these different hats just because as being a woman in the profession, I realize um, a lot of the areas that are missing in profession. So it's actually created work for myself. <laughs> so I, um, I, I'm really involved in these organizations to, to help increase the pipeline and the number of minorities in the field of architecture. And so a little bit about my background. I'm a real estate grad. Um, and very, very much so given the foundation I needed to um, move my career forward and to start my own practice. I didn't leave school anticipating starting my own practice, but that is kind of where my career path led me. I um, worked for firm sizes of all different types. I think that also gave me a background on looking at architectural practices from different vantage points. So I worked for a small two-person minority firm, EDH Design. I worked for a larger 200-person firm, Gopayet Associates here in Dearborn, Michigan. And I worked for Hamilton Anderson Associates, another uh, minority firm. Uh, that was at the time like 75 when I got there and actually grew to like 150. And actually, I only worked in Detroit uh, in, or in Michigan, and, but I did do work outside of the state of Michigan with those last two firms at uh, Hamilton Anderson and Gapari. Uh, then uh, something they didn't talk about when I was in architecture school, the, the Great Recession hit. Uh, I was uh, laid off uh, from an architectural firm and I started um, designing like LLC uh, a number of years back and had never really used it just for like small projects on the side. And in 2008, um, I was actually caregiving for my parents um, and had a, a family, so I wasn't going to relocate. And I uh, decided to put myself all into starting my own uh, practice. I had a partner um, that we started to practice together. And then as a uh, as introduced, I am now currently, like I said, the, the a principal at Quinn Evans, and I'll further talk about that story. Um, so coming out of school, I knew a lot about architecture, but I didn't know a lot about business. So I, I also tell people I have what I did was a living MBA. Um, I, I went to a number of business classes with uh, Kaufman's Fast Track to the Future, which uh, in 2008, everybody was talking about entrepreneurship in the city uh, because we we had to you know kind of depend on other industries and create uh, get back to our creative roots of our of our city. Um, so out of that efforts, I went to like the SBA Emerging Leaders Program and just got all of these like business courses on how to you know kind of start the back of house stuff with things with firms and how to hire people that I I just didn't feel like I had at the time. Uh, and then um, Design Core Detroit, which used to be called like the, the Detroit Creative Corridor Center, started this uh, huge effort uh, to lift up the creative industry and economy in the city of Detroit and in the state of Michigan. So I actually got very active in that organization. I had an incubator program there and uh, really actually started to get major contracts within my firm at that time. And also, when I was working with Design Core, that's how I got involved with uh, Hoping with uh, the application for the city of Detroit becoming UNESCO City of Design, one of the only ones um, in, the, in the United States that's a city of design. So I call this my living MBA uh, part of my <laughs> uh, career. Um, so now I'm, I started my own practice, but like I said, I am now at, um, at my practice, I had roughly uh, at the max, I had 14 people, including interns at my firm. Uh, and then uh, probably just like I said, starting out from day one, it was my business partner and myself. His name is Daniel Thomas. Uh, but then we met Quinn Evans uh, through relationships. So I actually had a great um, ally and mentor, Liz Nibby, who was a principal at Quinn Evans, and we actually started to pursue work together. 
Um, and we'll talk more about that. Um, but that's what led me to uh, Quinn Evans. They acquired my firm. And my business partner and I and all our staff came over to Quinn Evans. And we came over to Quinn Evans, and I can't believe it's already been over four years ago. And, and I came over knew, and knew that the firm was going to become a woman owned you know, business. And that really interests me uh, in stepping away from my minority owned business and, and, going, and coming to this larger, you know, hopefully bigger impact uh, space. Uh, so Quinn Evans is a firm that's over 200 people, and we are 50. And 4% women and over 51% uh, owned. And so that makes us one of the largest, uh, if not the largest, woman owned architecture firm in the country. So that is was very appealing to me and, and made a big shift in my career uh, for my own practice. So in my own practice, I was doing, uh, being a tech town that started to create my, net, my network. I actually had an office building and this uh, very entrepreneurial center it was in the city of Detroit. And, and then they were looking to create a co-working space. Uh, they were early in the co-working space uh, world. They were, you know, WeWork was not in Detroit. A lot of other co-working space, I think it's like one of two maybe um, in, in the city. Uh, so, you know, they asked us, like, will we be interested in this project? I was like, yes, I can design everything I needed as a small business owner in one space. I would love to do this project. And so it, it became one of the largest uh, co-working spaces at the time when it opened um, in 2014. Um, it was over 20,000 square feet um, in a old Albertine building um, in the uh, New Center area, in between Midtown and New Center area of Detroit. And so then uh, coming over to Court Evans, like very similar, uh, teaming up with them on different projects. Um, you know, very similar project types, right? Taking um, adaptive reuse projects, um, turning them into something new, bringing it back to the city, um, and almost riding that recession wave back up in the city of Detroit. And Jim mentioned uh, the Michigan Central Station project that was in the background of one of her photos. Uh, Queen Evans is actually, and this was actually almost like a big joke at Lawrence Tech, where both Gina and I went, but you know, many of us could look at the Michigan Central Station project as a thesis project at LTU when I was there. And then to be at Quinn Evans, and they're actually working on this project uh, with Ford Rand um, to, to re revitalize this abandoned structure and, and re, uh, restore it and actually uh, turn it into a mixed use development. So, really, uh, and, and basically looking at, you know, we have tons of build, existing building stock in the city of Detroit. Uh, in, in the state of Michigan that could be repurposed for other uses and the amount of embodied carbon that you save in that, in that effort is something that we're tracking as a firm. Uh, so that's be become very interest to me, interesting to me as a lead AP professional to, to see um, the impact of this type of work. Uh, so I'm just going to actually walk down a street in Detroit and kind of talk about my relationships and some projects that I'm working on currently. Um, and this is West Grand Boulevard uh, for everybody that uh, kind of knows Detroit is laid out in the radio grid pa pattern. This is one of the main artery streets that comes out in that uh, you know, the, uh, downtown area that uh, comes off the west side of the city. Uh, so West Grand Boulevard is north of Cork Town where that Michigan Central Station project was at. And uh, working with a local gallery owner, George Namdi, um, in, in creating this West End gallery district area. Uh, he worked with a, a planner to kind of lay out uh, some property that he owned that he was looking to develop. Uh, so the first neighborhood retail node um, is uh, a, a building that he bought and actually ended up because of environmental reasons having to demo it. And it's a 30 unit apartment building going and it's as far, far in. Um, uh, at the uh, neighborhood retail node. Uh, and then further down Grand, Grand River uh, is another node, it's called the Nam D project space. And um, that was a project that I worked on with George uh, that is actually getting bid out now um, that is a currently space for gallery owners, right? And how to teach them how to uh, come into the world of being a gallery uh, retail uh, owner and how to get into that type of work. And just this area is not a lot of things are happening to it now, and a lot of planning studies have came out of this area. So 
Um, I ended up meeting another, uh, teaming up with another, um, actually very similar to what Gina was talking about, a neighbor down the hall from us in an office building that we were Willis, uh, MKSK, and Woodbridge is right down the street uh, in Grand, um, Grand River as well. And we looked at a master plan uh, study for this site and we got the reuse fit for this site um, that um, takes the old Hancock School, which is here, and looks to turn it into a community hub in the existing Woodbridge neighborhood. Uh, and basically just really working with the community and come with I up with ideas of how to uh, plan out this and how they could phase this large uh, uh, underutilized sites that they have right in their own neighborhood. This, this is a well lived in neighbor neighborhood. It's adjacent, it's historic, it's adjacent to uh, um, Wayne State University's um, campus and uh, very much sought after neighbor to live in, but they do have these two large, this is the largest uh, sites that they have to develop. So this is the old River White School site um, that was across the, from the former Mayor White, which is now on um, Douglas uh, Academy. But we actually looked at how can we plan out this using the existing context that was there before and creating a commercial car corridor along Grand River, which is here. And then how can we plan it out that they can actually phase this development and actually infill their neighborhood and complete out this neighborhood that has a rich history. So. I think this is right down the street from each other. And the next project I'm gonna look at is right across the street with the big circle around it to the uh, uh, to the right here. What's the next one? Uh, is the Love Building. Uh, so the Love Building was another relationship. And all of this is along the same avenue, Grand, uh, Grand River coming out of downtown, literally blocks from each other. And it's just great that these relationships and these networks are literally um, People that I've been moving over my career through my through my studies with my what I call my living MBA and you know, really starting to meet key nonprofits and grassroots efforts you know, in the city of Detroit. Um, this is this building was bought by Allied Media, and when I initially went after this RFP, um, and this was actually an RFP that came actually all of these projects except for the one with Woodbridge, or relationships were started when I had my own firm. And then these projects were brought to Quinn Evans when I um, my firm was acquired by Quinn Evans. And when I responded to this RFP, this was only for a fourth floor office space to fill the um, Allied Media's offices. So we actually got into a lower campus plan um, after we um, uh, further, like the nonprofit, further started to talk to the community. We did community outreach. Um, we actually did uh, engagement events for. Um, both uh, the Woodbridge, I'm sorry, this is actually out of order, um, for the Woodbridge and for uh, media uh, projects. And the same same individuals were directly across the street from each other, and we were both coming to these, uh, both of these community engagement events. And our uh, media saw a larger effort that they wanted to do with the love building. So we did a master plan for the entire building, and they actually uh, came up with bringing in all their fiduciary partners, um, and actually taking up the whole building. So it went from by the time I got to Point Evans, it went from a one store, one floor project to us doing the whole building. Um, and it is actually under construction now. This is actually the construction photo that's off to the left, and an existing photo was the before um, um, that is off to uh, the right. Uh, we opened up the windows and um, added an elevator. Uh, core here because this building was not accessible. Um, and one of the key partners that, are, that is going to be a tenant to this building, one of the fiduciary partners with Allied Media, is Detroit Disability Par Power. And they actually advocate for people for disability rights. So that became a key effort after our community engagement and stakeholder engagement uh, to, for moving this project forward. So we looked at inclusive design strategies. Uh, looking at how we can minimize floor changes, how we can actually look at not only wheelchair disability, but other disabilities as well, as far as if someone is uh, sight issue impaired or if they um, um, are, are deaf and literally looking at how those spaces affect um, individuals. So when we came into the building, it actually had split levels. So we actually demoed out this split level because it was a former furniture warehouse. And this warehouse um, basically uh, had the loading areas and everything in the back here where you see the door off to the left. Uh, so we flattened out that floor and gave equal access and entry 
to uh, each individual. So this is at the front of the building. We actually added a two bay elevator uh, tower onto the building, leveled out the first floor. Um, and then basically we didn't want to do a wrap, right? We didn't want to have someone come into the back door of this building and feel like they weren't equal. So all of these issues came out of the community engagement. Uh, looking, at, looking at disability at a deeper uh, level, inclusive design at a deeper level, looking at um, the products for people who actually don't have use of their hands, who don't have use uh, uh, to, um, you know, can't, ain't unable to push an elevator button, just everything you can think about in this project from widening doors uh, beyond just the 36 inches to um, uh, everything focused around disability. So this this is just kind of like I said, my quick walk through um, relationships and pro projects that I'm doing in the city. Um, and then the, the last slide is my project that I was talking about, Noir Design Part uh, T, which I document the work of uh, African American architects, and then doing a podcast with this. So um, my career is steadily changing, and that's just a quick snap at slip shot of what I will do. And then now I will hand it off uh, to Christina to uh, take over next. Hi everyone, thank you. I'm Courtney Petrowski uh, with uh, Living Lab. Um, we are landscape architects and planners um, in the city of Detroit. Um, we uh, have a, uh, our practice is really in community driven design and project realization focused on public space, uh, parks, um, non-motorized transportation and urban design. As Gina mentioned in the intro, we are a uh, woman-owned, uh, Detroit-based, triple bottom line company. And in that, um, we make a commitment to um, our social environmental impact in addition to our financial performance. Um, so we're really, we're really um, looking at all three elements of the work. And uh, let's see, I wanna make sure my screen is not sharing the right thing here. All right, here we go. So design for people. Um, so when we started our firm, I think much like Sandra and Gina's stories, um, we had uh, all uh, four, three of my partners when we started uh, had worked in larger firms and we had been really focused on, um, you know, hours build, profit, uh, design awards, um, and um, we're, we're somewhat frustrated with that and felt like it was kind of on, out of line with our, our vision to focus on people, um, community, and the environment. Um, so we, we launched our business in a uh, very strategic effort to um, place more emphasis on relationships, um, whether that's um, the client relationship, the relationships out in community, um, but really uh, making that an important foundation to our business. Um, we did this really without, again, like Gina mentioned, I think there's some threads that uh, will flow through this narrative. Uh, we did this without um, a business plan. We did it because it was a passion of, of ours that we had uncovered um, working together. And the partners in the original business, which has transformed over time, um, we, we came from very different backgrounds, three landscape architects and, and one planner. Um, and we, we really brought a variety of experiences to the table. But I think what was most important to that is um, a commitment to, um, to community in all of our work. Uh, In our externally in, in our externally facing work, we we focus really heavily on community collaboration, um, bringing engagement activities out to the community as a part of all of our design work, um, taking our work out through um, our mobile lab uh, engagement activities, which bring uh, basically our entire office out on site. It's something that we have had incredible success uh, really engaging people in the, um, the work of design, whether that's understanding 
um, the requirements of the work, um, understanding their desires as a um, as a user, but really um, engaging folks in the spaces they occupy. And I think this is really important. It's something um, that has been a challenge for us um, through COVID when your work is focused on community engagement and that goes away. Um, it's been a challenge. These images here, I think, are um, profound in the way that we continue to uh, do our our do our work um, with and alongside people, whether that's um, going to parks and talking to the you know group of cheerleaders, or um, doing pop ups uh, on on a, a, in the community. Uh, in the wake of COVID, obviously, we re-examined this engagement focus um, and, and, and thought, how do we work with our community partners um, while also placing value on people's time, which I think is hugely important in this people component of our practice. Um, Detroiters are, I guess, in my opinion, overly engaged oftentimes. There are so much development uh, happening in so many neighborhoods that um, people people are asked to do a lot, to provide a lot of their, ex, their shared experiences, a lot of their expertise on a neighborhood scale um, to better projects. Um, but we continue to look for ways to share updates and information on platforms um, that sort of veer from the typical public notice, um, looking at ways to uh, focus on social media and make people aware of new projects in the community, uh, whether that's using ways to communicate with the community like TikTok, um, other social media platforms, um, using communications with neighborhood, um, our district level neighborhood uh, groups, but we're really trying to make engagement around uh, development and planning projects uh, more accessible to folks where they are. Um, interestingly enough, this uh, project, that little TikTok clip, um, is Bagley Streetscape, which is a new shared street, street in the city of Detroit that connects right up to that Bagley Bridge project that Gina was speaking about. Um, bringing that um, connection over the highway further into uh, Mexican town and creating a plaza-like space uh, deeper into the community, as well as making some connections to non-motorized transportation networks. Um, the work we do uh, in, in community really is focused on creating spaces that reflect those they serve. Um, that are flexible and adaptable to the community need. And quite honestly, in a city where we often hear things like Detroit is a blank slate, which is just such a horrible statement, we like to focus less on what people like to call place making and focus on place keeping, really ensuring that community space improvements reflect those that they serve, uh, the neighbors. Uh, that surround each project. Um, we also focus on people in our internal space. Um, we are located in a co-working space called the Green Garage in Midtown Detroit. Um, that is a community of approximately 40 triple bottom line businesses. And this has been incredibly important for the growth of our business and those relationships that get formed. Um, Sandra and Gina both talked about long-term um, relationships with um, clients and team members, but I think almost more important, well, maybe equally as important to us, has been collaborating with business owners early architecture, engineering, planning world, but follow a similar mission-driven um, approach. So, um, just surrounding ourselves with like-minded people in our business has been incredibly powerful. Um, and they've often shared uh, relationships with us as well. Um, as we have grown um, and contracted, we have gone through a period of you know, expansion um, 
where we we thought being bigger was better for us um and that and we ultimately acknowledged that um in our work our desire for connections with people and forming deep relationships with um our clients our community and um we really realized that having a larger staff simply diluted that experience. We weren't able to ensure that um, we were servicing the community and clients in, in the way that we expected to. So we have strategically refocused our scope of work on many of our projects to support um, this relationship development and have started to limit um, our relationship, you know, new relationship growths growth simply because it has continued to be challenge, a challenge to us um, with the amount of work currently out there and the schedule demands. We really have um, continued to, uh, I guess, rely on our existing relationships because we know what those outcomes are going to be and they're going to be re remain true to our kind of mission-driven work. Um, so client relationship maintenance and those long-term understandings of how a team works has been important, but we've also some, somewhat contracted our um, the scope of work we focus on and um, really committed to the visioning, the community engagement, concept design, um, and then often handing over architect of record, landscape architect of record uh, responsibilities to others so that we can continue to follow sort of that community driven design work through um, CDs and construction in a manner that allows us to focus on the impact on community versus, um, uh, you know, technical details. So the, the planet part of being a triple bottom line business um, is really acknowledging that the work we do has positive and negative impacts on our organization, um, as well as the natural environment. And that's both within our, the decisions we make um, in our office and in our practice and then in our designs. And I think we hold um, really climate change and social justice as critical factors in the work that we do. Um, We've seen, we really actively seek opportunities to make change, to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, and, and that's been made quite easy by our location within um, a triple bottom line co-working community, uh, the Green Garage, where the commitment of businesses and also the building itself um, is on uh, sustainability. Uh, we, we do things like utilize our local bike share, focus on recycling, and the businesses within our Green Grash community, on average, uh, you know, we create as little as 10% of the waste of an average business, uh, as well as significantly reduced water and electrical usage. So it's really, I think, incredibly exciting to see that work reflected internally in our office, but then in, in the projects and the designs uh, we work on. Um, this is an example of one of the pivotal projects uh, for our firm, which is Beacon Park in downtown Detroit. Um, it is a, a privately owned public space uh, that uh, was developed by DT Energy, um, but for all intents and purposes, focus uh, is viewed by the public as a public park. Um, it has a, um, a restaurant on site uh, that is LEED certified, and the site itself um, manages its stormwater, is planted with native plants, um, local and recycled materials, um, just a, a, a really lovely example of cutting down on energy consumption um, and making sure that the products we specify are close to home um, and really maintainable. Um, when we're talking about landscape architecture and site, uh, maintenance, growth, uh, deterioration of elements exposed to the outdoors and the public uh, is a huge consideration that uh, we also really focus on in our work. Um, we also encourage and support our clients in actively engaging the community in their sustainability stories. So um, much of the work we do, I think often um, it, it doesn't 
it, it isn't understood or doesn't resonate with the community. So we've continued to um, really support our, our, our clients in um, educating folks about um, things like bee, sa bee sanctuaries in Beacon Park, green stormwater infrastructure, um, recycling, um, and then again, focusing on that um, issue of maintenance capabilities as it relates to sustainability. Um, a lot of our work is for the City of Detroit uh, General Services Department, which uh, manages all of their parks. And this is an organization that has historically been very strapped for um, staff and, uh, and, and maintenance capabilities. So they um, they have needed our help and we've been wonderful partners, I think, with them in understanding their capabilities and designing to, um, to support their ongoing work. Um, so just another, some, some pictures of some stormwater and permeable pavements, as well as locally manufactured materials um, for Beacon Park. Uh, and then the last pillar of being a triple bottom line business, um, as, as purpose-driven professionals, um, we want to we want to do all of this work um, to lift up people, neighborhoods, the environment, without hampering our own um, financial performance, our, our commitment to our staff and our partners. So um, really, this is where it gets to limiting our client list to align with projects and a client base um, that we can collaborate with um, on a, you know, folks that have a similar ethos and mission. Uh, because it just really simplifies the work we do. It makes sure that we're doing work we care about um, and that we can be proud of. And, and I think this is an important lesson learned um, within our organization over the years is that that makes our work, um, we're just, we're happier <laughs> with the work we do. We enjoy it, even the challenges when we know the outcomes um, kind of meet these three pillars of criteria. Um, so we've continued to work with our clients to make sure that their projects are adaptable, um, successful, and engaging so that their bottom lines are being met as well as ours. Um, we want to make sure that the work supports um, the impact that they intend to have. And we're lucky enough to be able to work with a lot of folks who, um, who, who provide opportunity for the public to experience new and different things, to engage together on site and, um, and experience nature in different ways across our city. Um, and, you know, I, I think the most important thing to us always is to make sure that in our work, we're continuing to leave space um, to create uh, new and unique work uh, for the community to come together to um, to really make their spaces adaptable and changeable. And this is a great example of just making space um, for organic growth and arts and joy and community to, um, to happen in the spaces that we design. And I think that um, following the triple bottom line ethos for our company has, um, has been nothing but beneficial to us and our bottom line. Um, people, impactful design for people in the environment. Um, people are first. Uh, I think they continue to bring our company joy. Um, they continue to make us proud of the work they do. Uh, and we're just happy to share this story with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Courtney and, and Sandra, um, for sure. We really, really enjoyed hearing your stories. Um, what I'd like to do now is actually start with a few, um, I can't find my video. There we go. So I'd like to start with a few questions um, to each of you. Um, Sandra, can you share with us one or two lessons learned from starting your own practice? Ah, uh, yeah. So, um, I think I think I I see all of the uh, the the threads between our 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 stories and sure. um, one of them definitely would be um, um, even if you're at another firm please you know start your 
your relationships and your 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 networking um, early in your career. Uh, it it just pays off later in so many different ways. Um, even without even having your own practice, uh, that was the catalyst for my firm surviving for over a decade and coming out of the recession and being able to um, get work. Uh, it, it was, you know, people I've met, uh, people who started to trust me because I showed up in the community. I showed up um, to support. Uh, and that was just the the biggest uh, lesson uh, for me. Um, the other thing is, is to understand the business side of architecture. I would say that's a that's a <laughs> a big one to uh, make sure you uh, get some background on and um, uh, you know understand what it takes to run a practice, uh, uh, how much to charge for your work, uh, how to put out proposals, how to respond to RFPs. Um, some of the things that is hard to for architects, I think, to sometimes step back from designing and. Um, actually kind of just do the business side of things that need to be done. So uh, one of the, the phrases they taught me in uh, the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business was to spend time working on your business, not just in your business. Uh, so I think those are the two biggest ones that I have uh, from being a firm owner. For sure. Courtney, how about you? Any any lessons learned? Um, I think it it's being, you know, one of them has been being true to what makes us proud of our work. Um, you know, I, I think we have truly um, gone through really a big curve where we thought growing would be positive and we've, we've grown and, and contracted really um, with intention because it allows us to do the type of work in the way we choose to do it. Um, and I think the other piece is really um, to position yourself as an advisor to your clients um, and to use your, your collaborative team, whether, you know, for us, it's architects, engineers, um, others to, you know, bring those people with you to support the work of the client. So much of what we do, um, our clients don't understand the the ins and outs of, of, like I said, maintaining a site or the sustainability components and what uh, what those take to continue to um, ensure that they function over time. So and the advisory role, I think, is is huge um, and, and has been uh, an important thing to sustain our relationships with with long term clients. Sure, I think um, <clears throat> I. I've told several people this. I, I think, you know, I've, I've redefined what being successful really is as a small business owner. Mm -hmm. um, I think anybody can go out and actually start a business and do whatever they want to do, whatever that is for them. Um, but I think the real trick is um, how to keep a consistent workload. That's really tough. I mean, you you guys have felt it. Um, you you feel responsible for the people that work for you. Uh, part of that triple bottom line is prosperity. You know, you're you're helping those people continue to make a living, and the decisions that you make have a big impact on that. And I I take that with a great sense of responsibility for sure. I'll never forget the first time. Ken and I were closing up the office one night and I looked around and I'm like, how did we get all this stuff? And where did we, where did we find all these people? And oh my God. Um, but it just kind of hit home right then, you know, and this was, this was two or three years or, or more after we had started. But I think one of the other things is too, that um, you really realize that if you don't intentionally, as you said, Courtney, if you don't intentionally do something, it isn't going to happen. So you have to sit down and you have to decide, like Sandra said, you have to work on your business. You have to make those decisions. You have to figure out a plan to get there or reach out and find people that will help you make that plan. But I think it's super important that you realize, you know, I mean, I, I still do architecture a little bit, but not that much. And, um, and managing projects is huge. Uh, that's one of the big things I do from a principal level is I manage the projects, make sure 
that our people have what they need and our clients are getting what they need and things are trying to go as smoothly as possible. So those are two things that I've learned over the years. Um, very so, <laughs> very so true. I'll start with you on this one. Um, how have you seen that practice has evolved or changed over the last couple of decades? I think it might go back to that um, statement I made, at least in our practice, around what the expectations of a landscape architect or a professional team is. I, I feel like when I first started off, our clients were telling us what they expected. Programs were very clearly defined, and there was, I think, much less um, leadership from our side. Um, and now I feel like in the work that we do, um, there's so much leadership, whether that's in the initial visioning phase, um, um, deciding, um, or working with the client through programming or supporting their conversations with the community to, to define what a program is for, for a site or a project. Um, it's just such a transformational, I think, approach to how, um, how a project gets envisioned at the beginning, I think that's changed tremendously, sometimes for good and sometimes for bad. The, the one piece of community engagement is that oftentimes we're putting too much responsibility on the community and we're, we're asking people to provide um, information that often they don't have. So making sure that that balance is there is also something that I think is, um, is, a, is being learned in real time um, between clients and practitioners. Um, wh what is that right um, professional experience and community experience and how that comes together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Sandra, how about you? What do you think, what have you seen over the last couple of decades about how practice has evolved? Yeah, for, um, yeah, for, for me, it's been, um, well, it's two coming from, my own firm to a larger 200 person firm. Um, it's a little bit where you were talking about, Gina, like that inward focus uh, towards the staff. And basically the work that we're doing is making it like a movement for the entire practice, right? The entire firm. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to do certain type of meaningful projects. We want to impact um, our clients and, and the world we're working with. Um, and now that's an effort, right? It's like every time, every time we talk to a new client, we were basically joining in on their value, their mission, moving forward, and then actually putting them with the right staff members who have that same alignment, and then making sure that that project then uh, gets the deliverable and the impact to the community that everybody is hoping for. So this whole notion of of a movement and impact on the community has definitely changed um, uh, over the last decade to a decade and a half. Um, and really coming through um, the last two years too with some of the um, um, community focused design, you know, inclusive design that's happening within architecture. Um, it, it's actually put more meaning to into every move that we make we're not trying to design for we're trying to design with uh you know it's just changing the way uh we all come and not just say we're architect and we're here to save the day but we're we're the architect and we're here uh to make this this huge impact that you want to happen to happen together and that's the the notice that's the big thing that i've noticed within yeah uh, i i would agree with that i think i think the um I think the imperative that Detroit specifically has put on engaging the community, even if it's a private project, mm -hmm. has been a huge change. Um, I would say that the other thing that is, is what I talked about, I think digital technology has finally started to catch up with construction and design. You know, we've been working on computers since, for us, since 94, um, but digital technology has greatly enhanced what we're able to do in the amount of time that we're able to do it and with the people that we're able to do it with. So that I think is going to continue to affect our, our practices. And I think it's going to hopefully continue to affect the construction industry. 
<laughs> and I and I hope for the best. Um, I see a lot of upside to it. And I really think that it's going to be a major player over the next few years for sure. Um, Courtney, you talked about Beacon Park as being a pivotal project for you. Um, do you want to expand on that a little bit? How did that change your practice? Yeah, it was pretty transformative. Um, and I don't know how I really feel or how we feel about that transformation and, and, and the challenges that taking on that project was. Um, right. We uh, were the prime consultant for that project with architecture, civil, you know, MEP lighting, everybody, structural, all under our umbrella, um, which in many ways as a landscape architect, um, I love because I think landscape architects look at the whole of a project um, and can be really great um, navigators of that space. Um, but it was a new relationship with the entire team and the client on an incredibly high profile project. Um, and it was a gargantuan challenge. Um, the timelines were insane. The um, budget was undefined. The program continued to morph. It was, it was really rough. And everyone was incredibly committed to um the the impact that the project would have on the community and i'll say gina you experienced some of that that transition because our architect changed i mean everything changed um it was an amazing project that won us a you know a slew of awards in the end um but it was pivotal in the way that you know that could have been the space in which we took that you know all those accolades and kudos and built our business and use that to really become um, bigger and more. And instead, I think it really made us, you know, say, was that enjoyable? Did we, um, did we love that experience? And I think the collective thing was absolutely not, that was <laughs> not fun for any of us. And we, and, and it was pivotal in that way of like, we enjoy doing the work we do at a, you know, at a community level surrounded by people um, who have a similar vision. And, and it, it has been transformative in the, in the types of work we take on um, and those relationships we maintain. Great. How about you, Sandra? Would it, has there been a pivotal project either in your own personal practice or at Quinn Evans that, you know, has changed the way you either look at practice or that you do practice? I, I would have to say it's, it was, it was two projects. So, um, and, and it was me coming from my practice to actually me in my own practice at Centric Design Studio, working in partnership with Quinn Evans before uh, the acquisition. And one of those projects were, was uh, 139 Cadillac, which is uh, in downtown Detroit. It, is, it was a historic building that uh, everybody knows that it's right across the street from the, the um, Wayne County building. It has a 7-Eleven in the ground floor mm -hmm. and there was nothing above, right? The whole thing was empty. It was former office space. Uh, and then we converted that into residential, you know, very much what everybody's talking about today. And that was actually over five years ago. Uh, and that property ended up being, it was designed as uh, residential, but it ended up being leased by Sounder Hotel and um, as extended stay. And it basically the owner got full occupancy day one. So that working relationship, working with Quinn Evans really kind of opened me up to uh, getting larger projects with, you know, partners and not having to basically um, try to size up my firm every time I wanted to pursue something larger. So that was, uh, partnerships are great, uh, actually for small businesses as, as well. Mm -hmm. So then we, I teamed up with Quinn Evans for the 20th Century Civil Rights Sites Project uh, at, at my firm. And that one I knew, I was like, this is a great project, right? Looking at civil rights history throughout the whole entire city of Detroit. Um, but I know I don't have, as a small firm owner, all the experience that I need at the Michigan Shippo office to have them have confidence in me to, to complete this, this project. So let me team up with, with Quinn Evans. So after that project and the engagement we, have to, we had to do for that and looking at the sites, looking at 
uh, which ones, you know, to go to a certain level of nomination, which ones would get the national uh, nomination because it was only a limited amount of funds. We looked at 100 sites total. We did investive, investigative um, reconnaissance level studies on 30 of those sites and only four can get national nominations. And then SHPO actually did a grant for the fifth. So only five of those 30 made it to, uh, you know, national nominations. So just being out in the community, seeing the importance of history, the importance of public space, um, the importance of recognizing the importance of Black public space uh, in, in the city uh, was all just like, just totally life-changing for, for myself and my practice. And then the great relationship that I built on those couple of projects, I actually worked on a couple more with Glen Evans before I came over, uh, really led me to, um, like I said, got closer to my mentor, Liz Nibby, uh, actually uh, starting to have the conversation about, you know, uh, you know, we, we they used to ask us to at our in our Goldman Sachs small business plan like uh, class. Um, what is your succession plan for your firm? Right. And I was like, whoa, nobody's ever asked me that. And my 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 son did not want to be an architect. He told me right to my face. That was my last chance. because My daughter had already told me years before. And I was like, what am I going to do with my practice? So when talking with Quinn Evans, I was like, well, okay, this is one of the options that they gave us a succession, right? You could sell your practice, right? You could uh, you could do that. And I was like, okay, well, I, um, I didn't have employees at the time that were interested in, you know, taking it over because it was still kind of very, you know, your business is very personal to you too at first, right? When you're small, um, just like Courtney was saying, it's the type of projects you want to work on. I don't know if that was a type that everybody in our firm wanted to work on. So those, those projects led me to looking at... Um, acquisition as a succession plan and that really changed uh my trajectory after that so yeah very yeah. cool very cool well i talked about a ton of pivotal projects for us but i will tell you this um each of those projects allowed us to grow as as a practice and i i don't necessarily mean physically grow but it, it allowed us to stretch ourselves it allowed us to learn about different things. Um, you know, we, we always did research. We never got paid for it until we did the Ann Arbor Library. And we've been able to tell people that story and help them understand how that can really help the project and potentially change the trajectory of the project. Um, one of the other quotes from the library, uh, library director that I love is, she told somebody once, we used her as a reference, and she told somebody once, she goes, be careful, they will make you rethink what you think you know. So to me, those are those are big deals. Um, and and so we've been able to use each project to grow physically as well as to stretch ourselves and to learn. And and really, um, we have we have a handful of clients that think we're superheroes. We can do anything. It doesn't matter. They could come to us with, you know, a space station on Mars or, you know, something else. And and they think we can do it. And that's frightening, but it's also really awesome. And, and then of course, there are other people that think if you haven't done 30 libraries, you haven't, you can't do it. So those are, those are some of the things that we've learned over the years and the projects that we have done have, have changed our kind of focus on that. Um, Courtney, in your view, what is the ideal size firm now that you guys have gone kind of <laughs> up and down and experienced pain and suffering? <laughs> You know, that's a great question. And I, I, I think that's fungible, but I think what's probably most important is the type of core team that we have that works on the types of projects we care about, you know, is having that internal project team maybe makes more sense. I think we could have, we, we could have chosen to grow if we could have maintained, um, um, a small group relationship um, internally that um, kind of carried and, and made sure to always keep that sort of mission-driven focus um, and that institutional knowledge that we had built as a firm at the forefront of our conversations with our client. And, and I think for us, that's like a group of five to six people makes a nice node of folks um, out front, you know, visioning with the client and project managing, as well as thinking about 
internal and those doing the tuck and make sure all feel cohesive and um, still connected to that big mission. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that could probably be like scaled up in those types of, of, of um, core working groups, but that, that type of, of scale has continued to work for us. Cool. Sandra, how about you? You're, be careful, Quinn Evans might be listening. So you've gone from <laughs> small to really, really big. Yeah, it actually it actually worked out though. Like, uh, so like like I said, it, it, at my max, um, with interns and everything, our firm was roughly fourteen, and I always thought that was like not enough, not large enough to do some of the things that we wanted to do. Like to be able to have like someone that actually could be, you know, pursuing work and a nice uh, group of people with design and those group of people with production. Um, so I ended up with that. If, if, if you look at the, the whole firm, Quinn Evans is um, six offices uh, so that, and in Michigan, we have 54 people and our Detroit office at Woodward and Willis, there's 25. And to me, that would be the ideal size. And that's what I ended up with. That's what I met with every day, right? I have, it's a staff of 25 in, in the Detroit office. And that is, it gives you just that office culture that you're looking for. Um, we, we actually have to say to go back to the larger picture of one firm is that we uh, use national experience with local expertise. And that's what exactly what I feel like. So I, I feel like I'm getting what the size that I wanted uh, with my existing practice, because I think 25 is a good number, 25 to 30 is a good number to um, kind of do this, the type of work that happens here in Michigan. And also, um, but I feel like now I have, if I need it, right, I have capacity, right? So that's something I never had before. So sometimes when I talk to people now, I think I could do, I could sell anything because I'm like, I have people that could do it. It's 200 of us, but, but I don't get intimidated by that every day because I'm in an office of 25. Yeah. Uh, so that is, uh, I think that's a good size practice to have. Great. Well, I will, uh, I will just conclude that part of it by saying that I'm not sure what the ideal size is for <laughs> us. However, I will say this, we have been seriously focused and intentional about keeping our small office culture, even mm -hmm. though we're over 35 people now. Mm -hmm. And that is super important to us. It's just like you said, Courtney, that core, that, that feeling of being part of something bigger, that, that camaraderie, that is hugely important. And it's even gotten more important, I think, as time has gone on. I think this generation uh, behind us is latches onto that more than anything. Gina, I wanna thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, Sandra, uh, thank you and Courtney, but you're not off the hook yet. I haven't asked my questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, excellent presentations, all of you. Um, Gina, your, your, your projects are fantastic. I love the Cairo project. Uh, you should have won. Uh, obviously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but uh, it's, it's great that you're in that international market, which um, is a tough one. It's, uh, you know, I, I know the kind of effort those, those projects and, uh, you know, if if you win one of those, you, you, you elevate yourself into a completely different world. Uh, but uh, uh, great project. And I'm glad that it's in the uh, in the museum, at least that, you. Uh, you know, it's, it's on display. Um, question for you, um, uh, an interesting firm and an interesting the way that your firm has grown. Um, interested to know why you don't have structural. Uh, you have MEP and not structural in your firm. Is that a conscious decision or? It actually is, yes. Um, we, we have a great structural engineer that we work with. Uh -huh. He's trained undergrad as an architect. Um, so that'll probably tell you why we love him. And he's, he's such a, um, he's such a great designer. Um, he's one of the only, um, so engineers, right? They're PEs, but he is also an SE. He's, he's got a PE and in structural and then an SE also in structural. Um, but we, um, we, we actually, um, thought long and hard about the engineering. And part of our issue was that we didn't feel like we were getting the intentionality or the focus on our projects 
that we wanted out of pm and &E. And that is so integral to what you do as an architect. Um, you can't get away from plumbing and electrical and, and, and mechanical engineering. There's just no way. Um, and it was, it was more born out of frustration than anything else, honestly. Well, your, your, your solution is to hire the structural engineer. <laughs> right. He actually just went out on his own not that long ago. And we're like, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you talk to us first? He goes, you know, I actually thought about it. And I'm like, oh, geez. Well, especially since you take a look at a lot of your projects and they're very structurally driven, like they're, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're great buildings. I mean, the work that you've done, it, it's, it's, it's very imaginative, but they're um, uh, structurally, they're, they're, they're way out there. They're, uh, uh, they're really interesting buildings. Thank you. Um, and and then the the digital process and the computational work that you're doing is is also very uh, very interesting. It's uh, how, how did how did you move the firm in into that area? Was it was it one person at, at the firm that drove it into that area, or was it a conscious decision to develop that part of the firm? So we have a young man, Azuike Anonye. He came to America from Nigeria. Uh, went to Lawrence Tech and graduated, started to come work for us, started just like any other, you know, uh, emerging professional, right? Started really getting interested in the computer and why we were using it as a tool instead of using it as part of the design process. So he really he started using his own free time and, and personal time to really explore that and came to us and said, I've got some ideas. I really wanna show you guys what I've been working on. And once he started showing us what he had been working on, we said, listen, we're gonna get behind this. We really wanna see this move forward. And ever since then, he's basically been a full-time programmer. So I'd say probably it happened well before COVID, which is my time marker these days. I don't know if you guys are that way, but um, probably in 2017 or 2018 is when we really made that switch. And it's it's been transforming to our practice for sure. Lawrence Tech hired us in 2018 um, to design the, the new residence hall on campus. And we, we were looking at the exterior and looking at the fenestration. It was very tight budget, very tight timeline. And Zuby came to us and said, we can look at this like 300 different versions in about 30 seconds. We're like, perfect. That's what we're gonna show them when they come in. So he ran it and they just stood there with their mouths open and said, okay. Um, let's narrow this down. And so we were able to do that in about five minutes or so, or whatever it was. I don't remember. This was a while ago. And, and they were just astonished at what we were able to accomplish in the matter of a few seconds compared to weeks that it would normally take you to look at different versions of the exterior. Right. right. And it's interesting that all three of you talked about um, no business plan. You got into it because you lo love architecture and uh, and and Gina, I'm, I'm interested. In, you know, uh, obviously, you're not doing a lot of architecture right now. You're really managing. So, you know, you 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 as as you grow, you you tend to move into, but you never lose the love of of, of architecture, and you you always try to get back in there. I'm sure, yeah. um, Sandra. Um, I, I don't know where you get you know, some time to relax because if you take a look at all your slides and everything that you've done and, uh, you know, your living MBA and uh, your podcasts and everything that you're doing, it's, uh, it, it, it's pretty amazing. And you probably made the right decision to, you know, uh, to go to the bigger firm. I'm, I'm sure that you're, uh, you probably have even more time now <laughs> to, to do the things that you really want to do. But um, Quite honestly, uh, you seem you seem to be the kind of person that thrives on continuing to develop and continuing to with your involvement with the AIA and, and continuing to um, you know have a passion for for architecture and for the business and to um, to do different things. Is 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 that where you see your future and and, and continuing to evolve? Yeah, yeah, I um. 
I actually recently we just had a conversation about this uh, in our firm. Um, it, you know, is it? It I had to, I, I was able to peel away some of the layers that basically you have from having your own business. Like, oh, now I have someone that does invoicing. I have someone that does, you know, all all of that stuff that like I was talking about the business side of architecture. I, I have people now for that. I have, you know, I have an admin. I got staff, right? I'm like, cool, right? Yeah. But I also still continue to see um, the gaps within the profession. And that's kind of what my role as uh, yeah. director of diversity, equity, and inclusion came at, at Quinn Evans. Because I'm like, Quinn Evans, you knocked it out the box with figuring out, uh, you know, women and working with women in the profession of architecture. Like our current CEO who just became the uh, president and took us to that 51% ownership is Allison Steele. Uh, when she was at, you know, starting out at Quinn Evans, she was a 32 hour employee uh, because she had a family, but still was able to grow her career uh, and, and, and basically end up becoming a firm, you know, a firm president. Um, and I'm like, well, how do we do that for other areas, like uh, other minority groups, other, um, you know, um, uh, you know, pieces that are missing within the profession of architecture. So it did give me that platform at Quinn Evans to say, okay, now I can continue to, uh, the podcast started from like, how can I continue to find out everybody's story, right? And um, I was interested in doing a book and um, connected with Gable Media, which is an architecture podcast um, entity that um, basically was like, you're doing these interviews anyway, why don't you just record them and they become your podcast? And I was like, okay, you got me, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and but it 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 does give me the platform, um, being a part of this larger firm to um, work with, you know, my, elevate my work with Noma. I started out as Noma Detroit, you know, chapter president, and now Midwest vice president of the region. Um, I think that's as far as I'm gonna go though. <laughs> and I with Noma, but, I don't, uh, I, don't believe, I don't believe you. I, I don't believe you. You're, you're gonna keep going. But you know what? It's 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 one of the things, and, and and one of the reasons that I do NORAD is because it's 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 architecture and it's continuing education, and and it never stops. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, true. You, know, um, you know, we're working with Renzo Piano on a on a project here in Toronto, and 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 he has continuously said, uh, you know, as an architect, you really start working when you're seventy, and that's that's because that's when you start to understand. Man what architecture is about. And that's when your career really starts. Uh, and, you know, to a certain extent, it's, it's, it's about, as you said, Gina, it's about experience and uh, everyone on this panel has, has said that. It's, uh, uh, you have to get to a certain part in your life where you, you start to realize what, what, what you don't know. And, uh, and, and that's when you really start to, you know, fix everything. And it's, um, uh, Sandra, I don't, I don't think you've started. I think you're just beginning. I think you've got a long way to go. Courtney, um, um, the, your point about getting the right mix um, on the right size firm, we're at um, uh, Nora's 14 offices with 800 people, but um, um, you know, uh, Chad is on the line and the, the Detroit office is obviously not 800 people. It's a much smaller office and uh, we make it work because there's there are 14 offices and we have offices that uh, in the UK that uh, you know that have probably 10 10 people so uh, our model works because there are 14 offices and, and not all of the offices are big, as big as the Toronto office which is I was about the same size as Saunders firm so uh, but you you're right it's it's trying to find the the right um, size that where you can really, really serve your your um, your clients and really make a difference. And because uh, if you're not doing that, then, and and certainly with our offices, <laughs> they're all different. And, you know what what our Detroit office is doing is different than our Chicago office, and is different than our our Calgary office. But we yeah. kind of make it work, and. I'm, I'm glad that uh, you know you're downsizing or right sizing. Yeah, you're, and I think for us, right sizing has been about really understanding where we best serve our clients and, and narrowing our scope of services that we focus on for a majority of our projects, um, so that we can really do what we do best um, and and um, work with our partners to do uh, the other parts of each project. 
I have one final question. Uh, so I know where Sandra's mix is because she's over the 50 in her firm. Uh, Courtney and Gina, where, where is your mix with men and women in your, uh, in your firm? Let, let's start with Gina. If I'm not mistaken, we are closing in on that 50% number. Are you? Good. Good. And Courtney? We've vacillated, but um, at our highest, we are 75% women. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah. Right now we're yeah. about 60. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. I won't give you our number. Uh, I, I think in the introduction uh, that, I, that I did for this, I don't know if you're all wet, read it or the people that are on the line read it, but the design survey basically looked at the 100 architectural firms in the world and um, uh, mm -hmm. the numbers are, are pretty astounding. I mean, it's 18% women and 82% men. Which, which is pretty sad. I, th I think the United States is doing a fantastic job. Uh, the, the, the US of A really is, is doing great. Uh, Canada, not so good, and the rest of the world is doing very poor on, on women in architecture. But uh, those, unfortunately, are the numbers. I think it's, it's changing, but uh, uh, that's, where, that's where we're sitting right now. We just need to do, uh, worldwide do a, make, make, make a better effort of it. So I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Chad Menard, who is the principal of our Detroit office. And uh, he's been receiving the questions from uh, the audience. So Chad, I'm gonna turn it over to you to uh, ask questions from the audience. Well, thanks, Silvio. So I, uh, I, I, know, I know the numbers are, are skewed the other way, but I, I really feel like it's going to change and very quickly. Uh, my daughter is recently in the architecture program, and she's in a class of 17 people, and 12 of which are female. So it's um, it's it's going to change, and I think it's going to change quickly. Uh, what what can you? And I know she's listening, and some of her her, her fellow colleagues are, are listening as well. What could you give them for advice uh, early on in their career? What they should be doing. Um, uh, if I could go first, I would love to jump on that one. So I actually met my business partner who I started my business with, Damon Thomas, at Lawrence Technological University. Um, so I would have to say uh, be, your network starts where you are. Uh, so very, very much so keep in contact with your classmates, your professors, because that is the beginning of your professional network that you can use to grow your career and basically end up with a bar business partner for life because that's what happened to me. So. Very cool. Um, I think my advice to anybody, honestly, um, it doesn't matter, male or female. Um, my parents always built into me that if you set your mind to it, you can do it. And you can do anything you want to do. This is America. You're not told which profession you're going to go into or whatever. Find out what motivates you and try to do that because that's, that's huge. And you can do whatever you want to do. And if you can't figure it out, reach out. There's always somebody that can help. Absolutely. Gina, you were one of the first people I, I reached out to um, when we started our practice to better understand the challenges you had in, in starting your firm. And I know we've continued to um, you know, be sounding boards at times of pivotal transformation or changes or other things. And I think, um, yeah, always be, just always be open to asking for support, um, assistance, um, just a, an ear to listen because so often, you know, the challenges um, in business are similar to challenges in relationships and that often you just need to talk it out. Um, so whether that's um, early in your career and you're deciding, um, if architecture, landscape architecture is right for you. I mean, these are things, these are, you'll, you'll go through, I mean, I think everyone goes through, um, you know, their own pivotal moments um, and, and, and having people, surrounding yourself with people who can listen is, is incredibly important um, at all phases of your career. And watch this NORAD YouTube when it comes out. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, any more questions from the audience? Yeah, there's, there's, 
to the audience here, um, would you able to would you be able to share uh, some insight into the percentage of competitions entered versus the number of competitions won? Hearing more about the tenacity, grit, and vision to succeed in those early stages of the firm could really be an eye opener for some of us. I think the hardest part, honestly, when you're young like that, you have a lot of you have, a, you have time, you have energy, uh, you don't have a lot of money. So we did all of our competitions um, on our own time, and whoever wanted to, you know, contribute contributed. Uh, we've we've only won um, a handful, and during COVID, we actually um, entered three more. One of them we never made it to the point of where we actually submitted it, uh, but the other two uh, we didn't we didn't win. So. I'd say right now we're probably maybe a 30% hit rate, which isn't terrible, um, but it takes a lot of time. Uh, you know, we made a decision after, after uh, the Providence Bridge, we made a decision that, okay, if we, if we can't afford to do it on company time, then the only kind of competitions we're going to enter are ones that are paid. <clears throat> so in other words, qualification uh, level, and then you're chosen, you're, you're actually shortlisted. So you get some, you know, compensation at least, but they, they can be really tough and really taxing on your, on your staff. Yeah. yeah. The other, the other interesting point is that uh, Europe runs on competitions and, and they're, they're, none of them are paid for, but that's the only way you can get work in Europe. Yeah. And that was that was I actually didn't say it in the beginning, but that was actually what me and my business partner did first in her design competitions. We did not win, not one. Um, we uh, we we had one um, that was for a museum in Mexico, and basically lessons learned was from that. It's you know learn about and at that time you didn't have computer. It wasn't an online submission. We had to mail our boards to Mexico, and they could not get through customs. So that was like a big lessons <laughs> learned, right? Um, but it did teach us, you know, like I said, when we formed our LLC earlier, um, that was our big hope, right? That we would win a competition and just kind of launch our firm and just come out of nowhere. Um, but we learned how to work together. We learned how to design together outside of school. Uh, it was done after hours. Um, we were still at two different firms at the time. Um, but it is a great way to, to work together and learn how you work together with different individuals to see if you have um, what it takes to kind of make it through a practice. One more question, Chad. The, that that was that was all the questions from the from the group. Um, okay. But you know, Gina, I I know I've 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 known your firm for quite some time. Uh, you know, knowing Corey uh, from your group and seeing it mature over the years. But and, and I always think, you know, if I thought of an idea that it's already been done, and yeah, a lot of times it's already been done by you guys. So it's 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 fantastic to see that. Uh, you know, the growth and, and maturity of, of your practice. And, and thank you, Sandra and Courtney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, on, yes. on, be, on behalf of uh, NORED, I want to thank all three of you. This was, um, it was a different format for NORED and it was a pretty exciting uh, uh, format. And uh, thank you, Gina, Sandra and, and Courtney for uh, a fantastic NORED. And um, uh, I think that, uh, Anybody that watches this will be uh, very impressed and inspired by it. Well, thank, thank you, you so again. Much. Appreciate it. And all the very best. Same to you. Happy holidays, everyone. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the invite.